Queen's residents come from nearly 200 countries and speak nearly 200 languages. At the library, we speak diversity. Join us as we honor immigrant heritage this month. For more information, visit queenslive.org forward slash immigrant heritage 22. Looking for things to do at Queen's Public Library? We've compiled 125 of them. Pick up a booklet at your nearest library location or view the list online at queenslib.org forward slash things to do. Share your journey with us on social media using the hashtag QPL125 and you will be automatically entered into a drawing for a free Queen's Public Library tote bag. Hello and welcome to Culture Connection. Um, Culture Connection is curated by Daniels Alaska. It is now in its ninth year at the Queens Public Library. We've been global since the, uh, the globe collapsed a little bit, um, but we are always proud to present international artists and emerging talent um, from filmmakers, award-winning master authors, musicians, theater author talks, photographers, filmmakers. Um, now that we've expanded into this virtual format, um, we've been, like I said, uh, international for uh, over a year now. So if any of you are watching from beyond one of New York's five boroughs, hey, um, I'm Taylor Purdy. Today we have actor Chris Carmack, who you know from Grey's Anatomy, who I've had a thing for since 2005's Related. And um, That's deep cut. <laughs> oh, we're going to talk about it. <laughs> and educator, Academy Award winning filmmaker, and now author, Milton Justice. Um, so welcome guys. <laughs> welcome to the culture connection. Thanks. Taylor. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Scary to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think the, the question that I'm curious and we were talking about a little bit backstage is an acting book. Do we need another one? Um, and then I was going through it. I was going through it this morning and what hit me so much is apparently, yeah, because if anybody has dealt with this kind of literature, and it is a big historical, from like Stanislavski on, it's a rich corner of writing, but it's frequently academic. And that's not what you're dealing with here. This is relatable. And as somebody who's been through every acting class imaginable, I was so refreshed by feeling like I was talking to a person and not, you know, uh, a stone legend. Well, it took me, I have to say, it took me forever to come up with a format. Uh, I first started this book, I think, 30 years ago. And so I had all these notes for the years of studying with Stella. And I had like, I don't know, 200, 250, 300 pages of notes. And I read them. And I was just like, ah, these are <laughs> terrible. And so I just kind of dropped it and dropped it. And then it came back. <clears throat> and then uh, this weird thing happened. Um, I was teaching in Korea, and my translator, uh, <clears throat> who was Australian-Korean, looked at me at one particular point and said, they don't have that word in Korean. Hmm. And I went, oh, 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 oh my God. I mean, I know this whole vocabulary of acting for my whole life. Now I have to really simplify it into how real people talk which oddly enough is what Stanislavski had hoped for in the first place. Uh, anyway, so my translator and I would go over to my house after class and after rehearsals and have a couple of vodkas or three or four. And then he'd go home and write me an email 
clarifying what we'd done in class. And then I'd get up the next morning and write him an email. And so anyway, I had them forever and forever and forever, nothing, put them in a file folder. And then one day it hit me that actors were starting to send me emails after class or after rehearsals because they weren't understanding something. And I am so not an academic, I cannot even begin to tell you. It, it's like, I mean, I've spent my life with people like Chris, you know, who has an audition, who has a problem, and he's auditioning for uh, I'll never forget, I was driving home from, uh, uh, I was teaching at Yale at the time, I was driving home from Yale and he called me because he had an audition for uh, the Broadway production of Entertaining Mr. Sloan. And I'm talking to him about actions while driving. I mean, it's, it's, it, it was like practical. Mm. And so eventually I was sitting one day and said, you know what, maybe, maybe it's these emails will be a key. And, and although I have to say, I, I th felt terrible about the fact that I was teaching acting and I hadn't read the Stanislavski book. I mean, and, who's gotten all the way I, through it, you know? Oh, oh no, no, no. I, it's, and, and so the head of the Moscow Art Theater, uh, a wonderful man named An Anatoly Smelyansky or something like that, anyway, was giving a speech in Prague and he said, well, no one has read Stanislavski's books. And I went, ooh. And he said, maybe my life or not, but not really. And, and I thought, that's it. And, you, and if you start to read those books, it's like, I don't know, there's a thing, and there's a student, and the teacher, and it's like you keep thinking to yourself, get to the point. So that was kind of, you know, it, it, it's not that it made acting simple, but it, but it really did kind of, I thought, I, I have to deliver for these actors. I mean, they're asking me specific questions. I mean, they that, don't that, want. It seems like such a simple answer, that the sort of like practicality of it, but it is kind of a, a rare approach. I mean, picking an acting teacher, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, Chris, well, I mean, you know, it's, I just I just want to chime in because I had a thought here. It's like you know, we live in the uh, we live in the world of the for dummies books, and I'm not I'm not putting I'm not saying this is like acting for dummies or anything like that. But everybody wants the cliff notes, and it's true. If you open up a Stanislavski book, you are going to be inspired, but it's not necessarily you're not going to necessarily find the answer to the question you're looking for. It's it's like it's like opening up this giant manual. Mm. And you you dust it off and you can dig for inspiration. But when you're like, huh. what what do you call it, Milton? An, a, an actor in de despair or a oh, actor yes. in panic? Actor in panic. <laughs> yeah, when you're an actor in panic, mm. uh, it helps to have the cliff notes. So uh, well, that, that's something that goes that's to your question of do we need another acting book? And it's, uh, you know. Well, that's something that's always, that I've always loved about like the myths around these books and and the kind of like intellectual genealogy, Stanislavski teaches Stella and on and on and on. And then, you know, as I mean, Milton, you had this big relationship with Stella Adler. You ran the her studio in the West Coast for years. You, I think, um, opened it. And and yet we should clarify that as we're talking about the differences between this book and some of the t text that came before it, it's not that necessarily the um, message or the ideology is, is different. It's each generation kind of repackages it for the work that they need to do at that point. And so to look at this as the next in the like birthright from Stanislavski through the group theater, through the actor's studio, I think is, is a good way to talk about it because what you've done is taken that and brought it to this new generation that has, I mean, Chris, you have problems that the group theater could never have dreamed of. Uh, we were talking the other day about, um, you'd asked Milton once about how do you play a plot device? <laughs> and like, that's a great question. And I would like the answer to that. <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's not digging as deep into the material as we can go. But it's <laughs> Milton, Milton, you know, he addresses in the book, he addresses a lot of things like that. Very practical, uh, very practical questions that actors have had. Uh, but it, it's true. You know, a lot of those um, a lot of those older texts are really dealing with uh, big material. 
um, you know, Odette's and O'Neill and all that stuff. Mm. And you and, and um, Milton refers to a lot of that in his text as well, because he's directed all those plays. He knows those characters like the back of his hand. Um, but he also talks about working with actors on television and working, you know, work, working with material that might not be as, um, as, I don't know, as big. What, what would you well, say? I, I, actually, I, 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 the truth is I, I now find it fun uh, because <clears throat> I feel like when you're, when you're dealing with a big play, my God, it is so rich. I mean, uh, the, the joke when either I'm directing or teaching script analysis is, will we ever get to the script? Because I spend so much time talking about the time and the, what's going on and what's going on beforehand. I mean, I do 20 minutes on the first line of Death of a Salesman. And so when you've trained yourself to work like that, then suddenly you get a piece of material that... You, you know, sounds like the writers think writing is writing conversation. And what I find from that is that it allows you enormous freedom. And if you're brave enough to do it, you come up with a choice because you worked on big plays that it, you say, oh, oh, psh, boy, home free with this one. Um, and I, I, I think... Um one of the best examples from the book is when you talk, you have a lot of conversations with Chris Petrovsky about Madam Secretary, and that was a television yeah. show. And uh, he really approached that like it was a piece of theater. And it's uh, fascinating even for me to hear about his process on that because he really dug in and, um, and did some magnificent work on that show. Well, and also I have to say, <laughs> as I laughingly look at you on Grey's Anatomy, performing an operation and i'm and i once said my students want to know what you think about but w what's interesting uh taylor is uh chris was in my class in the stella adler division of nyu and we were doing an exercise one day <clears throat> and it's an exercise i do on building the place and so he was working on this exercise very slowly visualizing it letting it hit him before he talked it out. I do a lot of talking out. And so he got to the end of the exercise and he looked at me and he went, dude. <laughs> and I went into the faculty lounge afterwards and I said, I think I just got the biggest compliment I've ever gotten from a student. And he said, what? I said, he called me dude. And I went, <laughs> oh. But what was interesting about that? Okay, so now we go years later. And he was opening in Summer and Smoke in London. Which which version was it? Did it have the um the was it the original draft or was it one of Williams' edited drafts? Do you remember? It, I, I think it was the original. The original uh, draft. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the one. That's yeah, it's got, it's got I, the yeah, prologue. It was, it was the original one because we'd worked on that a little bit. But, but it, it, he left a message on the uh, on my machine he said remember that fabulous show i told you about in, re in rehearsal i said i couldn't wait for you to see it and he said it's awful we opened in manchester none of us recognized the set it was nothing like we thought <laughs> and so i called back left a message and i said go an hour early and talk out the set mm. which is the exercise he'd done at um, at, at nyu Wow. in my class and he left a message and he said you're right see you at the opening but it, it was interesting that it, it, you know the the exercises that we worked on which seemed so fundamental but they still you know it's like whoo man they still work miss adler knew what she was talking about well, I'm so curious about the relationship between the from the from Chris's perspective, from the actor to the to the the instructor. I mean, picking an acting coach is a big choice, and having a relationship. I mean, you've been with Milton for years. It sounds like yeah. And yeah. I'm so curious about what you need from him. It's such a specific relationship. Well, you know. It's hard to work. It's all. It's hard to work in a vacuum, especially when you're working on big plays, 
um, especially let's say you're prepping an audition, okay, for a play, you need to understand as much as you can about that character and the play and the place and the time frame and the other characters and the plot and the theme and all these things. You need to cram a lot of work into a short period of time to be able to present anything useful. And um, you don't have a month of rehearsals to prepare for that. And that's usually when he gets the actor in panic call from me is, is on the audition front. And he's been very kind and generous to me over the years uh, to sit down with me. And, and he loves it. He, 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 I mean, he's a teacher in his heart. So um, at least well, I hope he is because I, yeah, I, have, I know I do. <laughs> um, and, and then during, during a rehearsal process, a lot of times you'll, you'll run into some frustration and you can't necessarily discuss it with the director or the other actors. And you have to have somebody to talk with it about. And um, Milton has been that person for me over many, many years that we've known each other. I was about to ask about that line between Milton and uh, one of your directors or a director who's really dealing with the actors at least. Well, you know, I've been directed by Milton as well, which I have to say is a fantastic experience, but it it, it can test a friendship. I mean, we'll be screaming, <laughs> screaming at each other in rehearsals, which is, you know, but that's part of it. That's part of, 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 the, of the work it takes to uncover uh, and excavate big ideas and um, and big choices in your work, and it can be really um, really difficult and frustrating. And uh, that's why I say you you can't necessarily talk to the director about things because you might end up in a screaming match. And with Milton, you know, it's like ah, we've been friends so long, we can scream at each other, and we know it's about the work. It's mm. not we're not gonna. This is not about. Uh, egos or anything. It's just about getting to the work. So, uh, so. And, and also uh, very often if somebody says, well, you know, the director says this uh, and it's not what we worked on. And so I will have no problem saying, well, the director is wrong. So <laughs> we'll figure out how to negotiate it. <laughs> that's a, a tough space to be in for that Chris. Be, yeah, when you when, when you hear that, it, it can be tough. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I know when I'm directing actors that I've worked with for a long time, eventually I, you know, th there are shortcuts and, you know, inside references that can get them there faster. Um, I'm wondering if you guys have developed any particular shorthand over the years. Well, l let me just say this. Uh, I, I think every teacher, if they're a decent teacher, has hopes that your students will no longer need you. Mm, okay. I, I mean, you really do reach that point. In, in fact, I often think if, you know, sometimes I think people, if they need me too much, they shouldn't get the part. <laughs> you know, because, you know, you have to go. It's one thing to have somebody to bounce off of. So there is a point where you don't need, you know, when you just don't, you don't need the teacher except on very, you know, rare occasions. Sure. Uh, unfortunately, Grant's working today. But my joke with Grant is that uh, he's been on Dynasty for five years and he still periodically calls me and says, I'm sending you a script because I cannot figure out what's going on with him. Um, and it's kind of a fun conversation. I mean, that's something that I, I, is so interesting to me about the, the way that you approach the book and the sort of different, like very specific different problems that an, a contemporary actor has to face. Are you doing a primetime soap opera? Are you doing a primetime drama? Is it a play? Things that weren't an issue, even like when Chris, when you were just starting the, I mean, I think about the short lived um, platform of Quibi, which I don't know if you guys ever dealt with, but at the top of the pandemic, Jeffrey Katzenberg had launched this thing that was supposed to play 15 minute videos up and down on your phone. Um, and the issues that those actors faced are in some ways universal and in some ways really unique to right. contemporary nonsense. So uh, I'm, I'm, the, the, the you made a point to parse through that in the book. I really liked Milton, and you you go through and you pull from actors you're working with, actors you admire, 
Um, there's some really interesting stuff about um, Ryan Gosling um, and where, what, why he's great for this moment and what might limit him. Um, and the other thing that really stuck out to me in um, terms of actors that you were just, uh, you were admiring, you have this passage about Steven Spinella and Andrew Garfield uh, corresponding before they'd ever met doing Angels in America. And I did a bit of a double take because um, if I'd just been reading it as like a history book, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have caught me. But reading it from the perspective of an acting student, it freaked me out because Spinella had been an acting teacher of mine for like a semester once. And being instantly right back in that position of like the vulnerability of, of an actor and an acting student and the sort of like, oh, please give me answers that no one can really give you. And that like walk in that line for, for somebody in your shoes, Milton, um, is such like a social experiment and to keep a relationship with somebody like Chris for so long, it, uh, that's a skill all its own, you know? Uh, I guess I, I find, well, first of all, I, I love teaching. I am so happy I can teach. Uh, I didn't even know I could teach until Stella told me I could teach. And she said, darling, I, I want you to teach for me. But with her, it wasn't like there was an option. She just basically said, and that's what you're going to do. But uh, interestingly enough, if I may read from... Please? Oh, good. I didn't think you were going to. Yeah. Yes. From the, passage. The, well, the from, the, from the definitive book on acne. But here's, <laughs> what, here's where this kind of started. And I noticed this is so embarrassing. July 10th, 1980. I was doing a play. And I got lost. And I was thinking about it. I, I even mentioned it in the book. I was thinking about it that I wrote Stella a letter. She was in California and I was in New York. And I wrote her a letter and I'm thinking to myself, so I had to write the letter. I have no idea what was in the letter because it wasn't like, we, you know, Xerox letters and mailed it to her. She got it, answered the letter and then sent it back to me. And I've always wondered, I figured the whole thing at the very least took 12 days. And I'm thinking, what the hell did I do in rehearsal for 12 days? <laughs> I love that you spelled that out in, in the book. The, yeah, I mean, I it to her and got weird. her by the, yeah. But here's what she said. She said, I got your letter and I'm rushing to answer because I want you to have confidence in yourself as an actor. The actor in you is beginning to feel the birth pangs and acquiring the roles during the rehearsal period, and that is very normal. The work you do at home is done and is in you. Don't worry about it. The things you have chosen for your past groundwork with your imagination, they will give you the confidence of rehearsal. Don't try to play the background. In other words, as I looked at this letter, which I have kept forever, and she was not answering specifically my questions. She was answering specifically my questions in a way that was giving me an insight into acting. Mm. Um, and in fact, I, I, I was, as you know, I was working with Lee Grant at the time and I took Stella's letter over to Lee's when I went over for dinner and Lee looked at it and she said, my God, she's defined acting. <laughs> And it, what hit me about it was if I'm going to take on, which I did totally by accident, this format of emails, it needs to be that general, but yet specific. Mm. It's addressing a specific problem that many, many, many actors have. And, and that's what really finally hit me about it I, when, I, when I finally realized maybe that's how I should do the book because I was having terrible problems. And we should say that um, the book is largely made up of your correspondences with, with actors. Yeah. Yeah. And I, because I kept thinking to myself, if an actor was writing me about this specific problem, then I bet many actors have problems like that. Um, and so it's not like, um, any anybody has um, a problem that no one else has, and and you can also kind of look at the problems, and then you can say, uh, oh yes, I see, 
I see what her problem was, but mine's similar, but not exactly that. But I can see where I came up against um, a wall. You you have a correspondence with Chris in the book that really resonated with me, kind of like that about Chris. You're saying something along the lines of right now, what I'm doing is like tr trying to do nothing. And then if it works, I've done the reparation. If it doesn't work, I need to work more. And I, I, I want to hear more about that. Well, that was um, that was kind of my way of verbalizing what he was just talking about, which is don't which, which Stella is what told you uh, don't bring your rehearsals to you don't bring your homework mm. to the rehearsal or um, or the audition or the audition or mm. I, I or in this case uh, the shooting of the scene um, you know. We work very fast on a television set, so there's not a whole lot of rehearsals. But if you, which can be really tough if you fell in love with some choices you made at home, mm. because then you don't even have time to sort of relearn them. Um, so that was, I guess, my summation of doing the homework in terms of the preparation uh, for the character, the um the impulses of the character the his relationships to everybody he's talking to and the material he's covering and then seeing what happens and if i've made strong choices in terms of the background of the character and what's bringing him into the room and and what he's trying to accomplish in that room then i don't have to do any work those choices do the work for me so that's what that's what that was about Chris, is there? And really, I, let me just say, you, he hits on what I think is the most difficult thing about acting. And Stella says it in this letter to me, it's letting it happen rather than making it happen. And mm. boy, I, to me, it's, it, it was like, that's why I liked the, how he verbalized it for himself, because it's like actors have this tendency, oh, I've made this choice. I'm going to go in and force this choice on this scene. And it sounds like acting mm. and, or bad acting. And just the idea that you trust the work and just let it happen. And well, um, I, I, I love that. I, I, I still use that in class, uh, yeah. what Chris said about how he works. Yeah, no, it, it, it hit me when I was reading it. Um, Chris, I'm, I'm wondering if there is, from any point in your career, um, a, a problem that you remember being a problem that you had to overcome, but that you were surprised was an issue. Something like the, how do you play a, a plot device? One of those, you know, something that, you know, acting class doesn't prepare you for that shouldn't be an issue, but only is because it's a network sitcom that's going to be a drama and you're a vampire. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that has really shown itself to me over the years uh, working as a television actor in series where you are on sometimes hundreds of episodes of this character. You're telling stories with this character that have not even been imagined at the conception of the series, right? That, I mean, that's yeah. how television works. I mean, unless you're on, um, you know, on a very specific show where they've had it plotted out for six seasons, not a lot of those exist, right? Yeah. So it's all kind of being built along the way. And and one thing which I found when I was reading Milton's book, I found interesting because when you're working on a, on a play, the text is there from beginning to end. Or if you're working on a film, the text is there from beginning to end. You have a world from with which to make your choices. And you make your big, bold choices and you fall in love with them and you get to keep them. You don't get to keep them in television. Mm. You, can, you, you can write your own backstory and three episodes down the road, it's rewritten for you. And um, in a way, in a way I've become a lazy actor. <laughs> I'm willing to own that. But also in a way, it's like everything is survival in this in this industry, right? Mm -hmm. When I was working on the OC in 2003, I had come straight from the school. Uh, I was working on O'Neill plays. I was working on big material with Milton. And um, I had an endless and, and important backstory for Luke Ward. And 
every episode it seemed like they were tearing it away and and filling it with trivial stuff and it was like heartbreaking that i had to let go of these things so uh, i would say now i'm very careful to really be casual with some of my backstory and really only build what's feeding this particular episode or this particular huh. scene. Um, because otherwise you can't help but throw scripts across the room and wow. that's no way to live. <laughs> Actually, I'm glad you brought up that era. Cause I mean, one, that's, that's a great answer to that question I was, I was asking. Um, but also um, around that time uh, you two filmed a dinner with Eli Wallach um, and we've got a clip from that that I wanted to show where your like 25 year old you is preparing for your future career. So Eve, if, if we can roll that for a second, that would be great. This is perfect timing. But I don't have a choice. The other thing is the lure of the quick career, which I have fallen into is, um, is and I think that's the differences between uh, somebody building their career brick by brick and sitting back and saying now what do i want where do i what do i want to build next what do i want to put next it's built overnight and you go whoa 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 right, right. and and you've got this now you have this to work with you're stuck with it and you want to go back in and you want to fill in the details and you want to you want to go back and lay those bricks but it's, it's, it's it, yeah the, you're you've got you're stuck with something now I want to rock. I'm gonna knock it all down and start again. But that's it's really good. hard. That's good yeah, that you that's have that. Knock it down. That, because that'll <laughs> save you. It really will. See, and I think you're. I can see in your eyes that you're wise enough now and onto the game, and that you've. You're not going to throw your life away. Mm -hmm. I hope you understand. Oh, I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah. That's What's your program else. called? How to work. Well, uh, I'm no longer on it, but it was called The O.C. And it, it's, it's just a teenage soap drama kind of thing. Um, big hit. Big hit, yeah. It, it was what does O.C. mean? Orange County. That's a dangerous place. <laughs> oh man! Oh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. Some kids but came up so to us at the at the beach today and asked him if he was on O.C. Yeah. Said, yeah. It happened in the grocery store this morning when we were. Well, this morning I was. This afternoon I wasn't. You, the most mail I get for anything I've ever done in my whole career, my whole life, mm -hmm. is one episode of Batman. <laughs> I, I played Mr. Free. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I, I imagine you haven't seen that since you filmed it. Uh, is that a yeah. weird, is that a weird time loop for you? And also, I mean, I was glad to find a, a part of you t like trying to look ahead to your future. You know? Yeah. No. I mean, I, I very vividly remember that conversation. Well, Eli and Wallach. I remember that twenty-five-year-old me. <laughs> I wish I still had that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting. You know, after that conversation. I went and I did theater in New York. I went and did uh, theater on the West End. And I um, I thought I was doing what I had set out to do, which was tear it all down and build it back brick by brick and 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 work on my technique and become a, a, a powerful, uh, formidable actor. And um, when I finished my run in the West End and I came back to Hollywood, I thought people would be throwing roles at me from, from my year of experience. And, um, and the casting directors scratched their heads and said, who are you again? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so I, I, Milton has a great story about this, actually. Uh, Milton, um, the story that Bob Hope, was it Bob Hope told oh, you? Yes, Bob yeah, Hope. Yeah, please. Bob Hope, uh, um, I've worked for Bob Hope for years, and when he found out I was from Texas, and he said, and so he said, well, you know, and he said, I had a, I had an experience when I played Fort Worth, and so I said, what was that? And he said, yeah, I went to, uh, I went around to the front marquee, and it, uh, but to see my name on the front marquee of the theater, and he said, and it, and it went up and said, and co-starring comic. Ben Hope. And so he said, and I, he said, I went to the manager and said, it's not Ben Hope, it's Bob Hope. And he said, the manager God. looked at me and said, who'll know? Ah. 
Oh, you know what? Actually, I remember what it was now. I, I, I remember. That's a good story, too. Not to not to not to put that one down. But um, you, you said you had an opportunity to go with Bob Hope to Vietnam. Vietnam. Yeah. And Stella and, and you were asking you were in the middle of your acting training and I'll let you finish that. one. Oh, 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 no. Uh, yeah, actually, it was to work on a sitcom and I came back to New York and I've been in California and I came back to New York and and I ran into the office and Stella was sitting there and I, I thought I, I, I said, Stella, I turned down a sitcom in Hollywood and I expected her somehow to stand up and applaud or something. And she looked at me and she said, darling, no man is bigger than his time. <laughs> and I looked at her and said, now you tell me? <laughs> wow. And uh, that resounds with me as well. So that 25-year-old me wanted to, wanted to scrape everything down and really build, build up brick by brick. And, and, but at the same time, when I came back to Hollywood and everyone was scratching their heads, and I had a, a long period of time where it was very difficult for me to get work, um, I, I realized very few people have the opportunity to build a artistry brick by brick and have a career at the same time. And um, and you will be faced with that choice. So I decided to go back to the big house that had no walls or doors and work with that and start laying the bricks in as best I could. Um, still using the technique and still trying to do my best, but um, but there was a reality there. I, uh, I grew up around a lot of people that had been doing daytime soaps for decades, 10, 20 years. And the, the line of how each of them handled that it reminds me of what you guys are talking about, whether one guy always did Shakespeare in the Park in the summer, one guy was just glad to have a job. Um, a lot of people would go through a phase where they would go and try to build some artistry brick by brick and then come back. Um, and I think that the, the, those soaps are such a great example of that balance between the like what you're imagining life as an actor is versus what it's like to actually have a, a job. And a, a friend of mine I don't, was doing research on acting jobs once, and we decided that daytime soap operas were the only really consistent acting gigs you could have because they were going to run for 20 years. If you were Susan Lucci, you were going to be safe. And that was the only actor in the world who was really going to have a gig that was going to last. And yet that's not what you're imagining when you run off to the West end. Right. And the like myth, you know, expectations, reality of building a career. I'm wondering what you would have uh, told that if you'd been at the dinner with Eli Wallach, what you would have said to that kid from the OC. God. I would have told him to do exactly what he did, to be honest. Hell yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Good. No, I, listen, here's the thing. I, you know, I think at some particular point, if you're an actor, you want to really act. And, and you know, there's a difference between one for them and one for me. Mm. And so periodically you want to do one for you. And uh, quite honestly, I think the reason to have a technique and to really find what the tools are is that, you know, if you suddenly decide you want to do a Broadway play, as many television people have, they're not very good. Mm. Because it, they've never exercised this particular skill set. I mean, I, I keep thinking your talent is like, part of your brain, part of your soul, part of these things, and you exercise it. I mean, you know, to me, Stella always said your talent is in your choices. That's something you exercise. You don't just suddenly make good choices. I mean, I was certainly not one of the better actors at the school. Uh, <clears throat> I always said I was in school for five years because I was slow. But the fact is, um, I got very good at making choices. 
Now, I got good at making choices because I've been teaching for 30 years. And every time an actor works, I, I, I work with them and give them some other alternatives. But it's like a muscle that you've exercised. So I think with a lot of it is that if you don't exercise these muscles, mm. they really do atrophy or you never find them. And then all of a sudden one day you say, you know what? I just, I, I want to do something. I have all the money in the bank. And so I want to do something. And oddly enough, well, I hate to be the prophet of doom, but it's too late. Mm. <laughs> you know, I mean, but it's because it's like, you know, that's really a, a, peri a period of your, of your education when you take on new ideas. And I mean, I didn't start studying with Stella until I was 29 or 30, which is why it took me longer than most people. Because uh, <coughs> everybody younger in class, man, they were throwing stuff up, doing stuff, and I was very, very careful. But that, that's something that you get into in, in the book, and I guess kind of where the, the title comes from, which is a great title, I Don't Need an Acting Class. But I mean, you talk about that, you know, kind of youthful desire to be like, oh, I've got the talent or I, I mean, in the, you open with a sense of like, everybody thinks acting is about being natural and saying lines, but it's really, really impossible to be natural. Even like, even people have to play themselves, man, difficult. Um, but that's it's not- so difficult. Yeah. And, 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 and it, it interests me how much I keep learning. Um, I, I gave a commencement, uh, 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 address once to a, uh, an acting conservatory and um, and also included was Holland Taylor and I was talking to Holland and she said God you are so lucky you you studied with Stella in her prime well I studied from when I started studying with Stella she was 76 and so, and in Holland's perspective, I studied with Stella in her prime, which made me feel very good because I kept thinking, I'm not in my prime yet. So I still uh, have time uh, to get it. But I'm, you know, I'm fascinated how absolutely incredible acting is. I mean, it's, it, it's I keep learning. I'm, I love being in class uh because every student has a different set of problems every student has something they've worked on and so it's just always a challenge to to try to help um and so it you know i i think that's i think that's part of it the, uh, the title of the book of course came came from just how many people there is no actor and of course who, not you know who hasn't heard somebody say um, you know, I don't need an acting class. And it's, it's, it's like, mm, yeah. So how's that working out for you? Mm. Um, so we're going to, we're going to take questions in a, in a second, but, uh, there are two things I want to say. The first is, uh, I think it's worth mentioning Milton that, uh, you had a, a big career, um, producing documentaries. Um, your, your Academy Award is for one of those. And I want to mention that, uh, Five of those have been kind of re-released and are currently having like new lives on some of the art house streaming services, Criterion Channel, Movie. Um, yes, I understand it's your effort that's made that happen. Otherwise, they'd be in obscurity forever. I mean, I, I definitely, definitely helped out. But the reason I'm bringing it up is that watching those films, which uh, that was a, a collaboration between you and actress turned director Lee Grant, the people in those films are so fascinating. You can't watch those without thinking, oh my God, how could you ever play that role? And you talk about documentaries a lot in the book. So I'm, I'm curious if those experiences impacted your views of acting after watching those people be real people and also kind of be directed by the situation and by you and Grant over those five films. Um. Yes, I, I was fascinated with real people. Um, <clears throat> I mean, what's what's interesting, if I, I will give a 15 second history of acting, um, uh, it, modern acting started with realism in the late 1800s. And it was the first time real people were on stage. 
I mean, no longer, it, it's like if you and I went to see Hamlet, you would not turn to me and say, oh my God, the same thing happened to me. My uncle killed my father and married my mother. Sure. I mean, you know, it's like nobody's uncle is Richard III. And so suddenly there were real people on stage. And that's why we had to have a Stanislavski mm. because mm. we had to figure out how do you play real people? And I think that's the reason there were so many writings and so many things that he tried in order to try to figure out how do we get to that. And the thing that I found in documentaries were twofold. Uh, one, how interesting real people in conflict are. And I mean, if you were to look at what is the definition of a play, it is a character in conflict. You can almost cut to the chase by saying, you know, where's the problem? Mm. And so you're watching people in with problems. And it's fascinating uh, in documentaries. Documentaries are very well edited. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, I was thinking about just watching the clip of you guys having dinner. Um, yes, yes. It was a long moment. Dinner. But it, but also, I mean, with documentaries, I mean, my God, documentaries these days are shot on video. We were shooting on film. And even then, for a 50-minute documentary, we had like 23 hours of footage. So we're editing it down to the gold. And in an odd sense, you do that as an actor. You think about choices, you think about choices, you think about choices. I have this thing in class. Somebody else, I'll say, so what do you think about that? And they'll build it. And I'll say, or just to get people to keep looking for other choices. And then you keep, you shop, you shop for choices. And then hopefully you come up with the best one. Um, but I mean, I think that's the thing in documentaries. I mean, we were so blessed with the, the, the uh, first of all, Lee Graham is an amazing person to question. I mean, oh, yeah. as an actress, I mean, this is what I found. She was, she is an actress, and so what she did was kind of enter the role of the person she was interviewing and ask questions of them that she would have asked herself if she were playing the part. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that's what made. The, the just the the kind of depth of the uh, of the interviews definitely I mean the 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 inter her ability to talk to those people and get those things out of them I mean th there's a shot uh, we have to move on from those but there's a sequence where she interviews one of the Manson girls and that is one of the most fascinating things in, in all the films and like we could talk about that forever but I mean just like take a moment to imagine interviewing in prison one of the Manson girls how do you get them to open up how do you get them but like it would make sense that it would, it would take an actor, someone who really understood that like way into other humans to make it work. But this isn't about documentaries. So I also want to say, um, but I have to say yes. one of the things uh, I, I don't like for actors to write down things. You I, mentioned on the book. Yeah. Yes. I find that writing is a different muscle than acting. Acting is out. And so I, so, I mean, that was always the thing for me is, you know, if you write all your work is on a piece of paper and I keep thinking, so what am I going to do? Hand it out to the audience and say, this is what I'm trying to do. And so, um, but I had a student uh, <clears throat> named Evan at Yale and he said, and he called me when he said, well, can I write questions? And I said, okay, you can write questions, but you have to answer them out loud as the character and so and, i mean in a sense you know I, listen you know there's no, there are no rules here some I, people it helps i i feel i may have uh contributed to your hatred of actors writing things down <laughs> well, it was it was maybe in our my first week of class with milton maybe the second week I was furiously taking notes. I was a, a good student and I wanted to remember everything. And I was, I was buried in my notebook making notes. And I, I wasn't even looking up. All of a sudden a hand came in front of my face, grabbed my notebook and he took it away from me and threw it across the room. And he pointed at my face and he goes, you are not allowed to write. <laughs> and 
like that was it. I was never allowed to take another note in his class. But it was an important lesson. Um, I can't believe people study with me. God, what a, <laughs> <laughs> what a jerk. But that was the beginning of me taking it off the page and, and putting it in my body and learning to, um, as you say, um, have it feed you. Have your choices feed you. Because making good choices and writing them down is a great exercise as a writer, but it's not going to help you as an actor. No, I, I, it's, I think if you approach it, um, I, I love the Harold Klurman book, even though I've never read it, called Lies Like Truth. And I love the idea of acting. It's a lie, but it sounds like the truth. And if you take it from that, then when you tell a lie, for any of you who might have told a lie, uh, you, you know you may be a little bit tepid with it when you start, but the more you tell it, the more committed you get to it, which is what we call rehearsal. And so I, I just feel like talking things out helps you because acting is out. It helps you get into a believability. Um, and uh, I think that's the reason. I, well, and also I have to say the letter Stella wrote me, I realized was based on the fact that I had, pages and pages and pages of notes about, you know, this play that I got stuck in. Hmm. Um, anyway. Yeah. So we're, we're starting to get questions. Um, oh. And us, which I, one thing that it's making me think about is that, I mean, after a chunk of time, you never know what the job that was to you just a job is going to be the thing that people care about. Milton, I mean, it's been 30 years and you, these documentaries are having this new life. And and Chris, I was on your social media and I was like looking at what, you know, which people were relating to you from what things. And it was through that that I started to put together, wait a second, hold on. And I realized that I conflated a number of your performances because I'd been like, you know, I'd just been a kid watching TV. But I every like four or five months, I have this image of this beautiful boy walking into a helicopter and i always think it's you on related but it turns out it's you that same year in um just my luck they'd been out the same year and i i was reading this and i had this flashback last night to being at the movie theater with my mom and being like that's the guy from that tv show related that i watch <laughs> he looks so cool in this helicopter and um it was doubly weird because i i was helping my aunt with something earlier today and she had been one of the costume designers on Just My Luck. So I'm having a whole like Chris McCarmick day over here. But seriously, man, it, the, 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 in my mind, it's you from Related taking one of those girls onto the, the Lindsay Lohan helicopter. <laughs> um, but like really, every like six months, that image comes back to me. I don't know why I like, I missed Nashville. I watched Grey's Anatomy, but it's that for me that is like, that's the you that's in my soul. Um, you, and you, ne you never know what it's going to be. Um, if there's any version of me in anyone's soul, I'll take that as a win. Well, I, even you've won, man, because <laughs> I, I, like, that is 100% true. Um, okay, so we've got um, our first question is pretty straightforward. Um, how, well, it's kind of a reverse. How could um, a director use this? Um, for dealing for uh, dealing with and understanding where their actors are coming from, because I mean Milton, you've you've been on both sides of that. Well, here's something that um, I learned along the way is that directors have no idea what actors do. That is so frequently so true. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, they just it, it is like it is not only scary territory for them, but it is also so intimidating. Um, um, I, 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 I gave a weekend seminar in New Zealand of uh, acting for directors, for film directors, basically. And I thought, who's going to come to that? It was jammed. And it was all the simplest things. People, uh, directors do not know what actors do. So in a sense, I think... Um, I think perhaps the book, without having to swim through um, the Stanislavski books, will, <laughs> you know, will give directors an idea of uh, what actors go through 
Because in an odd sense, in the best of all possible worlds, you, you want to be able to look to your director to help mm. uh, and, and to, to, to give you some idea of, of what you need to be doing. The other thing a, about the book, I have to say, I, I have to say about the book, my uh, my friend Albert Poland, who wrote the most brilliant book called Stages, which was about his life starting in like the fifties or sixties, as a manager and producer, and he said he said uh, uh, on Broadway, and he said uh, he said I read your book and I thought to myself I could never be an actor; it's too hard. <laughs> That's, that's a good Which point. Which is its own kind of appreciation, I think. Definitely. Well, do, Definitely. You think there's, do you think there's anything to uh, your whole your whole point is like you you can write down questions, but you have to speak out the answers. Um, is is part of that like for a director maybe helping point them in the directions of what what thoughtful questions they could help the actor ask, and then say your homework is. I, I think that's yeah. Mm. Yes, because I, I, I can tell you like. Over my many years in a career now, I know you say you hate effect notes, getting an effect note, uh, but, a, but an effect note can actually be very useful as long as, as long as the director understands that now you have to do what you, now it's your job to fill it up. And like, you know, if a direct, I can, I can, a director can tell me faster. Okay. And I'm not going to just do it faster. I'm going to come up with a reason it's going to happen faster, but I remember a horrible story about you. I don't know if I have it in the book or not, but you were doing an episode of the Superman series. Smallville. Oh, Smallville. Yeah. Yeah, you that's were doing an episode yeah. and you said to me, you said the director had this really annoying thing that he don't did. Don't tell on me, Milton. Don't tell on me. <laughs> <laughs> and but But just when he'd say... It oh just, yes, yes, yes. Just oh, when yes. we were starting to do something, he'd say, "All right, camera's rolling, sound," and then he'd go, "Now, intense, oh yeah, action. oh yeah." No, I remember what it was. What, like, I'm getting ready for the scene, right? I'm getting ready for the scene. We got we've we've, we've slated. Sound is rolling. We're getting ready, and he goes, "More anguish, action." <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, that would I suck, know, man. I can say without a doubt, one of the least helpful things a director has ever done to me in my career. I'd love, I, I actually, someday, I, I think I have to do, we have to do an article or something of actors telling stories of yeah. the worst direction they've ever gotten. Yeah. I mean, that was a great question that somebody asked earlier about how can you use this uh, as a director? Because you're so right, so frequently directors have never had to be on that side of it. I mean, we've all seen something absurd like that. But if with just the, the smallest bit of understanding, those like we could come closer together. But I mean, the the distance, and I, I think this is both like because on set they are distanced, but also in culture, like little little boys who want to grow up to be a director, little girls who want to grow up to be a director, uh, aren't aren't always the same kids that wanted to be actors and the film schools rarely, very rarely let you deal with actors until you're deeper into it. And it causes problems all the time. And I really do think that the simplicity of the book um, and the sort of like, because so many of the things you, you two talk about in the book are things that are caused by the realities of being on set. Um, there are things that you would never think to be concerned about if you were a director. Uh, I, can, I can vouch for that. There are things that I would never think to be concerned about as a director in this, but the minute I think about it from the side of somebody who has to, you know, be there and get hit by those lights and have more anguish, I realize, shit, man, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I should, I should be concerned about that. Um, Milton, we've got a question about um, about the Oscar and the Emmy in the back. Um, can you tell us what? Oh, uh, oh what, can you see those? <laughs> oh my God, what a mistake! Um, what you won them for, and uh, do you remember? Do you remember who, like, who the other nominees were in any of those years? Um, no. Um, the The documentary uh, was uh, the documentary that Lee Grant directed, "Down and Out in America," uh -huh. and uh, uh, the after uh, the the Emmy is a daytime Emmy for for an after school special. 
that um, was, was that, that it, one. what is that the one that Grant was in? No, that's that's another one. Okay. Uh, no, Madeline Kahn was at this one, and the totally unknown fourteen-year-old Ben Affleck. Yes, that one playing playing her son, and uh, Catelyn Adams was the director. Oh, also an actor, and, and I realized something in this conversation, and I thought I was everything I produced was directed by an actor, and 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 I realized how spoiled I was because I mean the first films that I I produced were all directed by Lee Grant. And then Lee didn't want to do the after school special. And so uh, Joe Fury, my partner, and I decided to ask Catlin, also an actor. And then oh. later, uh, I, I produced a movie called Losing Chase that Kevin Bacon directed. Kevin Bacon directed it. And wow. So, and so it all, it's, it's like I was walking into a situation of a director who had been, act, who acted and knew everything good that act, that directors had done, everything bad that directors had done. That's a great point. Yeah, and I mean, so the actor director was walking in with this vast knowledge of directors and also being an actor knew how to talk to actor. Mm. Um, that is actually, uh, Lee, Lee Grant talks a lot about um, the acting training that she'd had, she'd been a neighborhood playhouse gal. Um, she had not been a Strasbourg gal. Um, but uh, somebody here is wondering how you guys feel about the uh, Lee Strasberg's corner of the Stanislavski deviations. Um, well, it covers that in the book quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I mentioned it. I, I know the argument this is book. quite. Yes, uh, and, and I actually quote Strasberg. I sat in on several of his classes. Um, I I think there. First of all, there was an enormous personality difference, and I, I feel quite sure that I have a personality difference with all sorts of acting teachers. In fact, I've been known to say they're all charlatans. So, um, I I think. The Strasbourg training is quite possibly too personal. Hmm. It's too reliant on yourself. And, and I, it has never made sense to me. I mean, I've been part of these arguments forever. Uh, it's, it's like using yourself. And it just always would seem so limiting. I, I have to say, uh, um, at, when I was acting, uh, which was not particularly monumental, but I explained to somebody, I said, first of all, when I was growing up, I was a fat kid. <clears throat> so I always played old people. So mm -hmm. I never played anything like myself. And then I said, later in life, I don't think I liked myself that much. So I really wasn't going to go to my life for anything. And so it was never such a problem. Um, my feeling is that the difference between Stella and Strasbourg is that Stella taught us to come up to the size of the play, to the level of the play. And I felt with Strasbourg, the play was being pulled down to the level of, of the actor. And so my problem with that is as life goes on and people become less and less interesting, um, to go to your own life is probably not the most fabulous place to go. Okay. Yeah. I, I've had this argument before. I said, why are you even talking about this? Do you know these people? For God's sakes. These are people that think they have 1,700 friends on Facebook. And they don't know what friendship is. How could they possibly do something about friendship? Hmm. And, you know, I mean, it's it was like that kind of conversation. Okay. Um, yeah. Can I yeah. can I offer yeah, something uh, that I've actually never even discussed with you, Milton, because I'm terribly embarrassed. Um, so I, I 
I kind of agree with Milton a lot about the Strasbourg, the emotional recall aspect of it, taking you out of the circumstances of the play and, and, and some ways being a result oriented, like emotional trick you play on yourself. Um, I don't understand it in its entirety. I haven't done a whole lot of research. I've just noticed that it hasn't worked for me, but I have stolen one little thing about it because in, um, in television, we oftentimes have very, very casual, quick references to other people in our lives and in our history. Um, like, for example, I had a line in Grey's Anatomy where, like, you know, and then you hooked me up with Bronwyn and she broke my heart. And, you know, and then I and, and, I'm, and I'm moving on to something else. And it's like, I don't have time to build Bronwyn. <laughs> That's, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't have time to do, it's like, it's not an important line. It's not an important thing. It's not, it's nothing that's going to come back or whatever. So I'll like, I'll be like, okay, which, which X am I going to use? And, mm, and mm. so I don't, I don't alter the circumstances of the play. I name her Bronwyn. I make her Bronwyn and, you know, and I keep, the, I keep that world, but it's, it's a, it's like, it's a cheap trick and it's a little bit shorthand, but I do use it sometimes. I would never use, I would never use it in a play. Does that make sense? No, yes. How do you, how do you yeah. feel about that? No, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I, I, <laughs> I, listen, I, I, I keep going through what is the talent of an actor. And I think one of the talents of an actor is being able to figure out what needs the investment. Right. And mm. what doesn't. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and what doesn't need the investment? And, uh, and, and so that's one of those things. It's a throwaway line. She broke my heart. I, you know, the investment is I need to know how to. And the relationship with the person I was speaking to was much more important, required much more of my time and energy. And I felt like that, that, that settled the Bronwyn thing. It was something that happened 20 years ago in my character's life. You know, I, I do also think, uh, I know my fr my friend Marie Danvers, who's this wonderful, wonderful actress, singer, and we both taught together. And Marie was in um, an international tour, of West Side Story, playing Maria with, with, when it toured um, and uh, uh, Europe. And the director, uh, who had been the assistant on the original, say, "Now, when when they come in and tell you that Tony." Kill Bernardo, I want you to cry. <laughs> and, and so Marie said, all I could do was imagine that my father had died. And so she said, and every night they came in and they said, Maria, Tony has killed Nardo. And she said, then I'd suddenly think about my father dying and I'd start crying. And she said, it took me out of the play. Mm. And I, I think that's another danger. Uh, I, I, I think that's another danger of it. I think too too often it's used for an effect. Right. I mean, I feel sorry for actors anyway who all seem to want to know, so how do I cry? And I said, well, you take methylene, methylene and put it under your eyes and it will make your eye, you know. It's like somehow or another being able to cry. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I, 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 I would never use it for an effect. I'd use this, I'd build, if I needed, if, if I needed something big to happen in a scene, I would do the work that you talk about in the book. I would build the past, I'd build the characters and all that stuff. Mm. It's just like, you know how when people are coding sometimes and they just need to borrow a little code from something else and you know, we're just gonna use that. Like if it's, if it's a non-essential part, eh, I'll cheat sometimes. So uh, I wanna ask you guys just one more. It's kind of the the classic and always important question. Any advice for people starting out trying to build that 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 lattice work of a career? Um, from either of your perspectives, both of your perspectives. Maybe there is no advice. Maybe it's no, I, well I, I mean I, I I'm going to always come from the idea uh, and and as I as I said in the book, in uh, on the off chance that you're not Ryan Gosling, and that you get offered this part, which is why I talk about him because 
the, we had the same agent who called and said, will you look at the screen test of this actor and, and tell the director whether or not to send him to acting class because he's never studied. And I saw his screen test and I went, no, don't. If he goes to acting class, it's going to mess him up. And so, and then, you know, Ryan Gosling over the years, he went from one part to another, to another, to another. And so I guess, I think he learned how to act. Although I did read something recently that said that he, his agent told him to do La La Land because the movies he's, he was doing were so intense uh, <laughs> that, that, that they were, you know, messing with his psyche. Huh. Um, but I, I just think you need the tools. I mean, if you know, to me, if you were going to be a tennis player, you would have to know a forehand. You'd have to know a backhand. You'd have to know how to serve. Uh, I mean, it's just there are tools, and you know, then uh, when you when you know what you're doing and the ducks line up, and also you really, really have to know it's a long haul. I mean, it, it really is a long haul. It, it's uh, Chris and I were, were sharing an apartment in Los Angeles when he was first there. Oh, my God. I just, you know, it was months. He, he got great reviews and a play I directed him in and got a manager. But months went by. And I could tell when he'd been out and auditioning because he would be so depressed and it was month after month after month after month. And, you know, you have to take on board the concept of rejection mm. and, uh, you know, and just say, okay, that's part of it. And I know very, very few people who are healthy about it. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's very, it's, it's tough. It's tough. But um, back to Milton's, uh, original point, like if I, if I was offering any advice, I would say, find a great teacher that you respond to find a text. Maybe, maybe start out by reading some books. <laughs> um, this is a great one. Also, you know, I'd recommend um, Stella Adler and Stanislavski. Those are the techniques that have spoken to me. And once you, once you create um once you find what responds to you, what you respond to, you can find a teacher that is based in that technique and, and start doing scene studies and start doing work with other people. Um, and that's, that's where you start. Where it takes you is, is anybody's guess, but um, it could take you to a, a great like local theater company where you start um, doing some fantastic work that, gets recognized and leads to other opportunities. But um, as they say in Hollywood, work begets work. So- um, Which makes me think, uh, also something I always say, say yes to everything. <laughs> Until one day you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. All right. I've said yes. yes to a few things over the years that I, I, I look back- No, no, no. Then there's one right day you don't have to. But, but it's like, I, I don't know. I always sort of feel like if you get your foot in the door, that, that was the title of Lee Grant's memoir, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. I said yes to everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, cool. Well, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, I, I, I'm always curious about the like industry-related corner of that answer, but I think you guys kind of covered a version of that with the, the like rejection readiness. So... Um, unless there's anything else that you guys are on the cusp of, of covering, we've, we've, uh, and I'll, I'll give a little, hard. I'll give a one last thought about the rejection. I always do this after an audition, I would take my paper sides that had my, that had my, uh, my scenes that I auditioned with and I tear it into pieces and I throw it in the trash wow. and I say on the way out of the audition, um, I don't even bring it back to my car. I used to save them because I'm like, if I get a call back, I don't have to print it out again. And, and uh, the mental anguish of wondering, no, rip it up, throw it in the trash. And if you get another call back, print them up again. I, I like making that part of your routine, the doing it as you're leaving. Every now and yeah. then I'll, I'll, I'll find old old sides or tapes and I'm like, oh, it's been a, I clearly didn't get that job. I'll, I'll delete it. Um, yeah. But it's like, it's a later thing. The idea of building it into your system, uh, 
Chris, uh, Chris, Chris said he was doing that, and he passed it on to Chris Petrovsky, who would make a big deal about doing it. But I, I passed that on to people because, you know, I've watched actors before uh, uh, keep checking. Mm. Keep checking their phones. Yeah. Keep checking nice. their, their phones. Well. And, and I just thought, oh, my God, that's, that's just... I mean, that's just the horror. And I also um, try to think when I'm auditioning for a casting director, I don't think about getting this part. I think about making an impression and them it, it, that they will think about me for another part. Mm -hmm. Yep, I've I can relate to that. That that yeah. seems like the healthy way in. Yeah, um, I, and I also would say to um, I'd also say so so now so what are you doing? When you go to this audition, when Chris would say, well, I'm negotiating how they plan on using me, which was <laughs> kind of a, I, I mean, it was a semi-arrogant way, but it, you just needed to feel like that when you were going in, whether they were looking for you or not, for, for your type or not, yeah. you were going to tell them what they were looking for. And it really does come from, you know, knowing that I know what I know. And I mean, th that viewpoint on it is something that's always resonated with me personally. And I think that sense of like, I mean, Chris, being able to say that, I think in part can come from a larger understanding of how any of it actually works. I mean, it's so easy to think, oh, I got rejected because I'm not good or I don't look right. Or, but frequently it's just like you, they wanted Ross from friends. So they found Ross from friends. It, they, they needed Chris for something, for something else. And that sense of, I'm showing them what I, what this product that I am is, and at some point they're going to call up my store and they're going to need it. Is I think uh, makes a lot of sense and is a, a good reminder to you know yourself that it's not that you were bad, it's not that you were wrong, it's just that you weren't what they needed that day. But it's so easy to not realize that that's how the system works because so frequently it's just I need I need Chris Carmack. Can I get Chris Carmack? That's who I need today. And then yeah, I've also sat, I've also had the, the, I guess, blessing to sit on the other side of the table and be a reader at auditions. G great way to assuage that feeling. And it was shocking, shocking to me how many actors could come into the room, give an outstanding performance, and you just know they're, they're not, they're not it. They're just, yeah. they're not it. And I want to, I want to like run out into the hallway and congratulate them and tell them what a great actor they are or whatever, yeah. because you did a fabulous job. You're definitely not getting this job, but you were amazing, you know? Totally. And, and it's, it's, it's a really, really bizarre, it's a bizarre experience to sit on that side of the table and realize that as an actor, but it does give you a little <laughs> bit of, um, of comfort knowing that you can go, you can go in 50 rooms kill it every time, not get the job. And it wasn't because you're not good. Great. Okay. Well, I mean, I feel like I could talk to you guys about this forever, but we've <laughs> all we've already gone over, over time. Um, look, this, I mean, this was a really interesting way in. And I think Milton, you were right to have Chris join the conversation because dude, the, the sort of like real world element that you're bringing is, something that we don't talk enough about in like the mythos of being an actor or just acting classes in general. So everybody, I don't need an acting class, bookshelves, <laughs> amazon.com. Um, and I mean, as you can tell, Milton's had a pretty fascinating life on and off the stage um, and a lot of corners of this art form. So in between episodes of Grey's Anatomy, you might want to give it a read. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I guess I guess I guess that's good night. The library has, you know, has to close down and make sure it stays quiet there. So right. Taylor Milton, thank you for having me. Milton, yes, always Taylor. Nice Chris, you. thank you. For I'm coming. enjoying the book. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. It's Taylor good for it's good for reigniting inspiration. So if you're a pro actor out there, pick it up. You'll enjoy it too. That, that yeah. is true. And Taylor, and you did your mom proud. <laughs> <laughs> good. I think she's watching. So there we go. Ah, okay. All right. Good night, guys. All right. All right. Good night. Thank Bye. you.